Welcome back. Recall last time that we talked about GPS performance and we quantified, characterized performance through standard deviations or variances. We assumed that the errors would have zero mean. After all, if the mean wasn't zero, we should subtract it off and really concerned ourselves with the breadth of the error density functions. And we did that both for the pseudo range measurements, we called that sigma tau, and we did it for the payoff estimanda, sigma east, sigma north, sigma up, sigma time. And those uh, latter sigmas characterized the variance or the standard deviation of the error in east, north, up, and time. What we're going to do now is talk a little bit more about sigma tau. Having done that, we'll pull all the data together into to a thing called the error budget, which is nothing more than a table that contains really all the information we've talked about so far. So, um, I love this sketch. It took a lot to uh, generate it. And it shows the various GPS error components. And at the top is an error that no longer is enforced. It's a thing called selective availability. So I put that there for historical, perhaps even sentimental reasons. And it was an intentional error in the satellite clock term. And notice that it uh, uh, is shown there for a time period a little bit more than four hours. And the uh, variation of the error is around uh, 30 or 40 meters. The standard deviation as associated with something like this is probably close to approximately 20 meters or so. In the scheme of things for GPS, that was a large error. That error was introduced intentionally for uh, defense reasons, and some years ago it was turned off, and the current satellites that are being launched don't even have the capability to turn it back on. So this error is now replaced by a much smaller error for the satellite clock. Here on the lower left, let's take a look at this one next, is just a sample of the error in the ephemeris. In other words, the error in the location of the satellite. The thing at the top, recall, is the error in the satellite clock. Lower left is the error in the satellite location. Notice that it's a very smooth function over the four hours. And that smooth variation is caused simply because the satellite is moving across the sky and the projection of the error in the satellite location on the line of sight vector down to the user is changing as the satellite moves across the sky. Notice also that there are little jumps every two hours or so. And that's because in this data set, the GPS satellite was sending fresh ephemeris information every two hours. And so you would see those little jumps. In the lower right is the error not due to the satellite at all, but rather due to the reflections around the user equipment. So this is a characterization of what's going on in the few tens of meters immediately around the receiver. What we have there is a direct ray coming from the satellite, and then some error that reflects, or a ray that reflects off a building nearby, uh, a billboard nearby, a tree nearby, and that reflected ray adds to the direct ray and causes this error that you see there. We call that error multipath for the obvious reason that there are multiple paths from the satellite to the user, and that's problematic. Fortunately, that error is not that large. It's about uh, two and a half meters, typically. However, if you get into a very urban environment, you're surrounded by tall buildings, it can be quite a bit stronger than that. So this is not uh, a, a value that you can use in every GPS scenario. Above multipath is tropospheric delay. And so recall from our drawing from two or three snippets ago, that the ray from the satellite down to the user goes through the Earth's atmosphere. It transects the ionosphere. That's the upper left view graph. Uh, sorry, the upper left curve there. 
and then it comes down and goes across the troposphere, and the error associated with that is shown here. Notice that for the vast majority of time, that error is fairly small. And by the way, it can be well modeled, which makes it even smaller. But at the very beginning, when the satellite is rising, and the very end, when the satellite is setting, the satellite is low in the sky, so the ray is going through quite a bit more of the Earth's troposphere, and therefore the error is larger. Ionosphere is shown over here on the left, the last of our five villains. And uh, once again, it's a fairly smooth curve across the four hours of the satellite pass. The delays range from five meters up to 10 meters. Um, the, the, the 10 meters are in force when you're only using one of the transmit frequencies from the satellites, let's say L1. And if you can use two, the performance gets much better because with two frequencies, you can actually estimate what the ionospheric delay is and remove it from the measurements. Don't worry if that didn't uh, sink in right away. We're going to return to that concept uh, in the near future. So all told, what this view graph shows is that there are many error sources for the GPS measurement error. And here we've shown five. These are the five most famous, the five most important, the five most prevalent. And if you put them all together, you can talk about aggregate sigma taus of several meters. It depends on where is the sky, sorry, where is the satellite in the sky, how good are your models for moving, removing the tropospheric error, the ionospheric error, how accurate is the ephemeris on that day, and what is your multipath environment. So it's a complicated situation. All of these things come together. At the same time as you have that complexity associated with sigma tau, the multiplier the dilution of precision is a function of where are the satellites in the sky. So you can almost regard sigma tau as being something that characterizes the quality of the measurement, and then DOP characterizes, well, how many measurements do you have and how well placed are they? And so when you look at GPS data, you'll see a very jagged curve associated with dilution of precision. And the reason for that is that it jags up, gets worse, when a satellite sets. You've just lost one of the rows of your G matrix. It jags down, gets better, when one a new satellite rises. And so here, uh, the jag up is due to the setting of a satellite. And the jag down is due to the rising of a satellite. The rather razor scalloped curve that connects those two edges just have to do with the motion of the satellites across the heavens. Remember that all of those rows of the G matrix are dynamic. As the satellite rises and then slides across the sky, not only is that subject satellite sliding across the sky, but all the satellites are moving across the sky. Now, <clears throat> from time to time, you get what people call DOP chimneys. A DOP chimney occurs when you simply have too few satellites. And so uh, notice here, this chimney is really going higher and higher. It may go up to infinity. That's because we don't have four satellites in view. Without four satellites, we can't solve for the three plus one estimanda. And so the DOP will reflect that, capture that bad situation for us, and um, it will appear in this kind of plot. The purpose of constellation design is to put enough satellites in orbit so that this curve is always well behaved, no matter where you are on the surface of the Earth and no matter what time of day it is. It's not an easy thing to do. Remember, you have to maintain that constellation against satellite failures, and you can never quite anticipate the signal blockage that some of the user receivers might find uh, around them. So we have the two pieces. We've talked a little bit about sigma tau. We've given you some specific curves here on PDOP. 
and they come together in an error budget. It looks like there's a lot of information here, and I suppose there is, but it's actually a very uh, readable and good tool. What we do in this left-hand column is just list those five error sources that we gave you examples of, plus one additional one for receiver noise, which is just the thermal noise, the so-called Johnson noise in the front end of the receiver. And what we've tried to do is associate a number for the taken together, give us sigma tau for each of those six components. So ephemeris has a quickly varying component to the error. We call that the random component and a bias. Remember from our curves two view graphs ago that the bias is larger than random, and we see that here. Clock, one meter of bias, for 40 centimeters of random error. Iono, four meters of bias, 40 centimeters of random. Tropo, 50 centimeters of both. Multipath, one meter of bias, 30 centimeters of random, receiver noise quite small. Do not, please do not take these numbers as fixed. The real wild cards in here are ionosphere and multipath. We'll come back to the su subject of ionosphere in a few lectures, and it can be quite variable. It's subject to what people call space weather. So if the sun is very active, it will send particles into the Earth's atmosphere, which will cause the ionosphere to become thicker, thinner, and for the gradients to be quite sharp. Multipath is the other real wild card. It's a very, almost always a very small number if you're in an open field, and it can be a very large number if you're in a city. So we have summed these errors in the horizontal to give you just kind of an overall feeling of the, the strength of ephemeris clock and so forth. And this total sigma tau in this last column is the RSS, in other words, the square root of the sigma tau random, shown here in this column, plus the sigma tau bias, shown here in this column. We've also made an RSS sum in the vertical. And we come down here to a thing that we call the raw pseudo range. And the value here and here are just the RSS of the numbers above. So it's supposed to be an approximate capture of the full error due to all of those sources. The one processing step that we include in this error budget is smoothing. And what we mean by that is we just average over time. And so if we average for 10 seconds, let's say, we get a reduction in the random error. The random error is the one that's fluctuating in time. And so if we do a little bit of averaging, we can reduce that. We can attenuate that error. Notice that smoothing or averaging is not effective against a bias. A bias is a constant error. You can average a constant, but it just doesn't become anything other than that constant. So when we're all said and done, we said the smooth pseudo range has about uh, 25 centimeters of random and about 4.4 meters of bias. Is that an immutable number that's true for all environments? Certainly not. Uh, it varies, especially the IONO and multipath as we described. It also varies with the quality of the receiver. What we can now do to complete our error budget is just take this number, which is really our aggregate sigma tau. That's the thing that appeared in those matrices in the last lecture that we gave. And we just multiply by DOP. Now, if we're interested only in our position accuracy in the lateral or the horizontal, we would use HDOP, which is equal to, once again, an RSS, but now it's sigma east squared plus sigma north squared. And that very typically for GPS alone ranges from one to two. 
If it's 2, we just multiply our 4.4 by the 2, and we get 8.8. .8. It's not bad. Remember, we said that our experience with GPS receivers is that they give us 5 to 10 meter accuracy in the lateral. And now our analysis has come behind that and supports that kind of number. Vertical will always be weaker. VDOP will always be greater than HDOP because there are no satellites below us. So we don't have that kind of diversity of satellites spread around us like we do for the lateral or the horizontal. So vertical, VDOP, two and a half, three, numbers like that are not unusual. I took the two and a half, a very typical number, multiply the 4.4 and got the 11 meters that you see there. Next time, we'll get together and we'll talk about how to make performance better. Uh, so in that last view graph, we saw performance of 8.8 .8 to 11 meters. Uh, that's certainly good enough for a huge number of applications, but there are a lot of people who want to be in the one meter regime or even better, and we'll talk about differential GPS in the, in the next time that we get together. And it is effective against the biases. So recall in our last error budgets, smoothing was effective against the random. Now we need some kind of mitigation for the bias errors. And what we do is very simple. We just put a GPS receiver at a known location. Let's say at the cell phone antenna site or on the roof of the Duran building here at Stanford University. And since we know the location, we can estimate the biases associated with the measurements to each of the satellites. We take that bias and we broadcast it to users in the neighborhood of the reference site. And they suffer more or less the same biases as the reference receiver. So the so-called roving receiver subtracts the bias provided by the reference receiver. It takes that bias and considers it as a correction. We'll talk about this more next time. This concept of differential GPS has seen wide uh, appl application, so it's worth it. And notice that the goal is to get rid of the biases and drive down the overall errors. Thank you for your attention.